Hi, everybody. Welcome to the WRRC EKY seminar. So today uh, we have someone that does not really need an introduction. This is Dr. Thomas Jumbaluka, and he is now um, the director of WRC um, and also a full professor in the Department of Geography. And I think many members of his ecohydrology lab here, um, Tom does a lot of work on climate, um, has done the rainfall projections for the state, as well as the evapotranspiration projections. Um, and works on many cool projects, and today is going to present some of his work on um, invasive species and ecohydro height and ecohydrology. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thanks, Leah. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a great turnout. I'm happy to see. Um, so let me get started right away. Uh, this is uh, about work that is being carried out in my lab. As uh, Leah mentioned, we call it the Ecohydrology Lab, but it covers climate, climate change, a bunch of things. And I, I just want to describe some of the things that we do. Since I have a new job and I have a whole set of new activities over in Water Resources, not everybody in my new world knows all the things that we do. So I just kind of want to go through that very, very quickly and then get to the main topic, which is uh, one of our uh, biggest areas of research, which is looking at um, invasive plants and how they might affect water processes in Hawaii. So uh, this is a look at a few of the people in my lab. And I couldn't find pictures of everybody, so I see many of them here. And please excuse me for not having everybody's picture there. Uh, but we focus on um, uh, several things. Let's see this for, I guess the pointer's not working. Climate, uh, you can kind of put it into general categories of climate, climate change, Kind of traditional hydrology and ecohydrology, which is water processes that are, uh, in our definition, is water processes that involve plants. <clears throat> so I'll just go through a brief description of some things that we do and have done in the recent past. Uh, under climate, one of the main things that we do is to actually measure climate. And monitoring is, as, is something that's become more and more important, but it is less and less prioritized in terms of funding. It's not the sexiest kind of research to put stations out and make measurements, but it is really, really important. And so we try to um, find uh, support for it, and we try to build up the um, network in the state. We have a really big initiative right now that we're just gaining a lot of support to kind of build out a climate network across the entire state. Uh, but at this point, we all are already operating networks in various places in Hawaii and elsewhere. This is the oldest one. Uh, I installed stations at these three locations in January 1988. So that's over 30 years ago. Uh, this is one of our more remote stations. It's typical of some of these stations on this side. This one is located right here at Kohaku Palaha. And there's a, another station that's not on this map. It's right about here at Nakua. Some of these stations are so remote that we have to hike for on the order of 16 to 20 hours to get to them, or if we're lucky, we can get a helicopter lift in. Uh, so we call that HaliNet. That's on Haleakala on East Maui. We also have a, we're involved in operating a similar network on the Big Island on the windward and leeward sides of, um, of Mauna Kea. And we have a pair of flex towers that we call HabaNet in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Uh, we have been working on designing a network to build out from the, this network, which goes up to about 2,000 feet on the windward and leeward sides of the So in Mauna Kea, that is, the idea is that we would uh, complete the network all the way up to the summit of Mauna Kea. And so currently, the stations we have go up about halfway up the mountain to about 2,000 meters. It's a 4,000 meter mountain. We'd like to have uh, additional stations and a really important station at the summit. As you probably all know, this is not a very good time to be talking about installing any new instruments at the summit of Mauna Kea. So that, we're kind of taking a step back for the moment, but we do hope that at some point in the future we'll be able to establish uh, that important network. So when we get back data from monitoring from our own sites and from all the other stations that uh, are out there, they've been operated over uh, more than a century in some cases by many, many individuals and entities. We gather up all the data we can, and one of the things we do is to look at how these uh, variables 
uh, what, what patterns they make in space. And so we developed maps of rainfall, temperature, solar, and so forth. Uh, for example, the Rainfall Atlas of Hawaii is one of the projects that we're most known for. Abby Fraser sitting over here from my lab had a big role in this, in this version of the Rainfall Atlas. Uh, it is an online resource, digital, and it's used by many people. Last time I looked, there, there were over 350,000 page hits uh, for this website. We also did another project on evapotranspiration, and we produced these three websites from that. In order to estimate evapotranspiration, we had to map about 40 variables. And so we make those available through downloads, and a selection of those are available in interactive maps. <coughs> So following up on those efforts to create what were what are mean maps, their climatology, their averages over a long period of time, uh, we started to make individual time period maps. And Abby, again, worked on the first set of those, which was a set of what we call month-year maps. That is a map of rainfall statewide at high resolution for each month starting in January 1920 and going up to near present at the time. Uh, and then we extended that a few times. But one of the problems with all of these products is, and I should mention we also did a 25-year daily rainfall map set, uh, which Ryan Longman did. He's sitting over there. Um, one of the problems with all these is that when we get done, there's no new maps. Project's over, nothing, nothing more recent. And people are often interested in the most recent periods. And that's always frustrating. So this is a, a new effort that we're working on. And um, uh, Maddie Lucas sitting over there and Ryan Longman are both involved in this. And that is to develop a kind of automated system that continually updates and makes new maps as the data come in. And so we're well along in that. <laughs> this process. Um, grabs data online from a variety of sources, uh, does quality control automatically, uh, does gap filling to fill in missing data and data that have been rejected in the QAQC step, does automatic interpolation, produces a map, updates a website, and this is running on a server and happens automatically, in theory. And we have it working pretty well for monthly rainfall. Uh, and it looks like that. Here's the September map. <coughs> I should have updated this to the October map because we have a, a new map as of November 1st. So automatically, the October map was produced. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't looked at it. But this just appears. And um, yeah, so it's something that is a lot different from what we've had in the past. It will continue to update over time. <coughs> now, once we get the monthly rainfall map completely sorted out and working, the next step is to look at monthly temperatures. Uh, and then go to the daily interval and produce these maps near real time at a daily interval, including daily rainfall, which we're actually not too far away from being able to do because we're processing all that data at a daily time interval. We want to do daily temperature, solar radiation, humidity, wind speed. And once we do that, we'll be able to estimate uh, and produce maps of evapotranspiration. And that opens up many opportunities for applications that involve water balance, that involve the moisture availability uh, in the ecosystem. So we can do carbon exchange modeling, irrigation, uh, flood hazard, and fire hazard, things like that, and many other applications. So we're really excited about this. We have a ways to go in order to solve pro all the problems we need to solve in order to make all these maps, but we are committed <laughs> to doing that. <clears throat> So besides uh, just looking at spatial patterns of climate, we also look at climate change. And we look both uh, to the past and to the future. We've done a lot of work looking at historical trends in climate, uh, such as temperature. This is from a 2008 paper where we showed how much the kind of statewide temperature is changing over time uh, for all the stations, all areas, low elevation areas, high elevation areas. We looked at uh, nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures and so forth. And this analysis was recently updated and published this year, led by uh, one of my former master's students, Marie McKenzie. Uh, we also have a, a new paper that's um, in review, uh, kind of minor revision stage. And Aurora Kagawa is uh, responsible for that one. She's sitting over there. And that's another look at 
how temperature has changed and what in variables influence spatial patterns of temperature in Hawaii, which is a really exciting paper. Uh, we look at how we've looked at how rainfall changes, mostly the work of Abby Fraser. And so we have gridded rainfall over nearly 100 years. So she was able to take um, time series from every pixel in the, on those maps and do statistical analysis, do trend analysis on those, and then show the spatial patterns of those trends. And what you see here is the kind of yellows and reds are places where rainfall has decreased over this long period of time. And the hatched areas are where there's, there's statistical significance in those changes. So almost all places with significant changes are showing decreases in rainfall in Hawaii over that period. We've also done a lot of work on high elevation climate, uh, in part because we operate stations up in these areas, and also because this is an important zone for us. It's where we still have intact uh, native ecosystems. It's also where uh, we derive a lot of our water from water resources. Uh, this is one of the things we looked at, which is from one of our stations in the Hollymet system, which shows that the number of uh, zero rainfall days in the dry season has been increasing steadily over a about a 30-year period. So this has big uh, ecological impacts. For example, we think it, it has played a role in the decline of the silver sword, the Haleakala silver sword. <coughs> so we also are looking ahead. And to do that, we use uh, global climate models. And uh, we're one of the teams, we're part of one of the teams that does downscaling. Uh, so there are a couple of methods, or various methods, to take global models and then derive information from that and put it into a more high, rep uh, high resolution representation of how the climate will change in the future. So this is one led by Oliver Ellison Tim. And it shows. Uh, how rainfall will change. Sorry, there's not much details on here, but the red colors are again are areas where there's going to be a decline. This is end of century RCP 8.5 projection. Uh, but what it shows is declines in the sort of leeward and high elevation areas. The dry areas are going to get drier. Kauai is going to get drier everywhere according to this projection. And the windward areas are basically going to stay about the same or get maybe slightly wetter according to this projection. Okay, so we've done a bunch of downscaling studies funded by number of entities. Uh, sorry, I should update this one is now PyCast. <laughs> <Sorry, Lana. laughs> and we've had support from a number of other uh, sponsors for that work. OK, in hydrology, this is looking back a little farther. We've done a lot of work um, going back 10, 20, 30 years, uh, looking at especially kind of the general topic of <coughs> land cover change and how it affects water processes. So this, a lot of this work was done outside of Hawaii. This is in Pará, in eastern Pará, in the Amazon, in Brazil. And that's me a, lot, a long time ago, a lot younger version of me. And we also did a lot of work in northern Thailand, this particular uh, location. We worked for about 20 years in various projects looking at uh, land cover change in this kind of shifting agriculture environment and how water uh, flows uh, and erosion are affected by uh, human activities in, in these areas. We also worked in northern Vietnam looking at landscape fragmentation, how it affects water flows, and in uh, Yunnan province, a uh, district called Sichuan Bana, which is in the southern part right on the border with Myanmar and Laos. And we um, worked quite a bit uh, in that area on roads. Uh, so most of these rural areas we work in have uh, had roads built by the government to, uh, for one thing, to kind of police uh, uh, heroin growing and border crossings, illegal border crossings, and so forth. Uh, but these roads are poorly built and poorly maintained, and they're a big source of uh, runoff and erosion. So you can see a typical what these roads typically look like. And so during the wet season, they get there's a tremendous amount of uh, sediment washed out of these areas. And these are places where the farmers are blamed for all the downstream problems from uh, erosion and sediment transfer into the rivers. Um, and we, we found that there was a huge amount of this was actually coming from these roads that were not built by the farmers. They were happy to have them, but they did not build them, not responsible for them. So uh, under ecohydrology, one of the things we do is to uh, measure and model ecosystem fluxes. These are vertical exchanges of energy 
uh, water, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. So we did that in uh, Brazil, this time in the kind of uh, semi-tropical area, the savanna region near Brasilia, which looks like, <coughs> happened, looks like that. We did this kind of work in Southeast Asia. I was talking about the farmers and how, how much, uh, going back to the question about the sediment transfer, you can see these, uh, these rows are running straight down the slope, which you would think would be a bad thing, would produce runoff and erosion. But it turns out there's almost no runoff and erosion coming from these farm fields uh, because they maintain very high rates of infiltration by constantly killing the soil. <clears throat> We worked a lot on rubber, uh, and Ryan Mutz in the room here, he single-handedly built two flux towers <laughs> over rubber plantations in Southeast Asia to measure carbon and water vapor and energy fluxes on this important land cover. This is, at the time, was the fastest growing land cover in mainland Southeast Asia. We have maintained uh, flux towers in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. We maintain some for several years, right up into the closing of HCNS sugar plantation over this uh, sugar ecosystem, sugarcane. Um, <clears throat> another area we work on a lot is invasive plants, and that's going to be the main topic of the talk if I ever get to it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me just skip through some of these plants that we've looked at. This is, of course, uh, Myconia. Um, this is uh, Prosopis. Don't call it Chiave. Not Hawaiian. And uh, this is uh, from a, a site we were just closing now. Uh, it was funded by the Board of Water Supply in Makaha Valley uh, with kind of Mesic uh, native uh, stand and a strawberry guava dominated stand, <coughs> more or less side by side. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. We have some work recently done, funded by the Maui uh, Department of Water Supply in cooperation with USGS. We did a statewide study, uh, which I'll also talk about. Okay, and <clears throat> another main topic that we work on is tropical montane cloud forests. And really, the big question there is how much water do we get directly from the interception of fog? Okay, so this is water that enters the ecosystem, but you can't measure it in a rain gauge. How do you measure it? It turns out to be really hard to measure. And Han Sang, sitting over here, one of my students, is. Uh, uh, working on that project. I'll show you in a moment. This is from an earlier study we did. It was funded through the USGS. That's me and Mike Nullet there at Waikamoi, Upper Waikamoi uh, Watershed on Maui. That was about 15 or so years ago. The, and this is our current study. We have five field sites on three islands. It's the one that Han's working on. That's funded by PICAST. Okay, so we get to the main topic. <laughs> thanks for thanks for staying. <laughs> uh, so what I want to talk about is this big question um, that many people are uh, concerned about, wondering about, and, and that is, you know, how big an effect uh, do non-native, especially invasive non-native plants, have on water processing? Now it's widely thought that they have big negative impacts. And there's some evidence for that, as I'll show you. But there isn't really enough evidence to answer this question well. Uh, so we are working on that. So just thinking about it, what, you know, kind of abstractly, if you take a native ecosystem and you remove some or all of those native plants and replace them with some non-native plants, or especially ones that tend to be invasive, kind of aggressively replacing native plants, uh, what changes might you expect? What things could change? Well. There could be changes in soil characteristics caused by <coughs> that change in species. Could have effects because of maybe through fall drop size, maybe ground cover is different, maybe the leaf litter is different, it doesn't protect the soil. Uh, so that could change. Um, there could be a change in the interception of fog. So we are working on that. And unfortunately, the current project we have does not address this question about the difference between uh, native and non-native ecosystems in this regard. So it's pretty hard to measure and uh, we don't have much information yet on this and we don't we have very little information on whether uh, the fog is affected by by this change in ecosystem. 
But lastly, I think the one that most people think about is this, whether the replacement of native uh, plants could lead to higher evapotranspiration. And this is a concern because this would be a really big negative impact because it would take water away from uh, other useful things like supplying water to generate stream flow and support <coughs> aquatic ecosystems. Um, take, it would take water away from water supply, from stream flow, and from groundwater recharge. So if this is indeed happening, that's a really big negative thing. So it's a big concern uh, because of that. <coughs> so one of the species that everybody thinks about is strawberry guava. Uh, and the reason for that is, first of all, that it is very widely spread around the island. It's very, very extensively invaded already in Hawaii and many other places like Hawaii, all over the Pacific, all over tropical islands around the world. Um, and here's an example. This is a place where uh, an ohia forest has experienced a natural cycle of dieback, which um, occurs, as I said, naturally every few hundred years where all the trees in a stand, or most of them, die, die around the same time, opening up the canopy, allowing regeneration. Uh, but what happens now is that with lurking non-native species nearby, like guava, they take the opportunity to move in. And uh, there's a big change in the ecosystem in a, in a relatively short time. So that kind of green carpet you see there is all strawberry guava. And those few trees sticking up are the remaining uh, native trees. So let's get on the same page about evapotranspiration. First of all, it is a, uh, it is a process where uh, water is being converted from liquid to gas. So it's a phase change that involves energy. <laughs> and you could say it's, you could equate it with the total transfer of water from the ecosystem to the atmosphere by all, all the different ways it can do that. So we generally break it up into three components. Transpiration, which is the one that's most strongly controlled by differences in species. It's actually regulated by the plant. There's water that's being evaporated out of the pores in the leaves, out of the stomata. And those stomata can be open and closed. Uh, and different species have different strategies for regulating uh, the transpiration under different conditions. Wet canopy evaporation, which is water uh, on the wet canopy on uh, so rain or fog or dew that wets the outside of the leaves can evaporate off. And soil evaporation, so directly evaporating water from the moist soil. So how can invasion affect these processes? How can non-native plants affect ET or how can they, uh, how would their, each of those three processes differ for them compared to native plants? Well, in the case of transpiration, we think of these different things here. First of all, somatic control, as I mentioned, is a kind of species-specific thing. So plants evolve to control their, their stomata to regulate water loss, uh, and species have different ways of doing that and would respond differently to the, to the same conditions. Um, leaf area is important. So the more leaves there are, the more total leaf area there is, the more transpiration you'll have. And so some species support more leaves or more leaf area than other species, so that could have an effect. And root depth is also important, especially in places that periodically get dry. Uh, and so if they're during periods between rains, plants uh, rely on water stored in the soil. And the deeper uh, their root zone, or the, the greater thickness it has, the more of a reservoir of water they have available to continue uh, doing transpiration between rains. Wet canopy evaporation could be affected by how much water can actually be stored on the canopy, and so that would be affected by the leaf area and the leaf texture, things like that. Um, uh, canopy roughness is important because uh, and this is the roughness in the sense of how wind is affected by flowing over the top of a, of a plant canopy. So very smooth canopies. The air is not disturbed much, and so it just kind of moves along parallel to the ground. If the canopy is very rough, then you generate turbulence, and the turbulence causes the evaporation to become uh, more, uh, become stronger, become more effective. So 
the rougher canopies have higher adaptive transparency. So it could be a difference between native and non-native species in terms of canopy roughness. And soil evaporation, the main factor there would be the canopy cover fraction. So if you have a closed canopy, there's not much soil evaporation, basically zero, or very close to zero, negligible. If the canopy is open, then you have more water evaporating from, from the soil, because more sunlight can get down to that, uh, down to that level. OK, so all these things could change. Uh, out of these three, I'm going to be focusing on this one up here. I'm not going to be talking about these other two. Okay, so we have looked at numerous different uh, non-native species. These are some of the ones that we have looked at. We haven't done in-depth studies on all these, and we haven't necessarily looked at transpiration, for example, like myconia. But um, these are some of the ones that we are concerned about. So thinking about this. You know, just from a conceptual framework about invasive plants and transpiration, you know, why would invasive plants have higher transpiration? Let's pose the question that way. Or would we expect that? So we can start from this, which we know. All plants must conduct photosynthesis to grow and survive. Uh, and they do so by allowing CO2 to enter the leaf through leaf stomata, these pores that they can regulate, and regulate the openings. <laughs> so they have to allow CO2 to enter the leaf, and when the uh, uh, when they open stomata to do that, they allow water vapor to escape, and that's transpiration. Okay, so transpiration is kind of a necessary evil for a plant, especially one in a water limited environment. Um, and so all plants have to have a strategy for dealing with this kind of. Uh, conflict between wanting to take in CO2 and, in, under some situations, wanting to restrict water vapor loss. So plants do that in different ways. So we know that invasive plants, as a, as a group, uh, have some certain characteristics, certain tendencies. And one of them, not for all, but for many species, they tend to be fast growing. Okay, So they do uh, effective photosynthesis, and they may photosynthesize better or faster than the native plants that they're, re they're replacing. And it makes sense that if you grow fast, you're going to have an advantage, right? So in a competitive um, situation. So that implies that they keep their stomata open more than the native plants, or that they have more leaf area. So do fast growing invasive trees use more water than native trees? That's what we need to figure out. I mentioned before strawberry guava is uh, Probably the main concern. It's certainly the one that should be included in any study uh, of this nature because it's so extensive. Uh, it is expect it is thought of as a fast-growing uh, species, but we maybe have some conflicting evidence about that now. But it definitely does invade quickly. It's difficult to eradicate, and it has some characteristics that make it different, physically different from the native trees that it replaces. So here's a, a aerial photo of an area that's been invaded with strawberry guava, and you can see it becomes monotypic, pretty much excludes all other species, and you have nothing but strawberry guava. Uh, and that's very, very typical of this uh, species once it takes hold. Okay, this, is, this map uh, was done by John Price from the University of Waihilo, and it's kind of a scary thing, because what they show here, and this is already a bit old, so probably look even worse if you did it now. But the red areas are places where uh, strawberry guava is already established. And the yellow areas are places where John uh, projected that, you know, shows the full range, full potential range of strawberry guava statewide, where it could go if there are no efforts, no effective efforts to control it. And the green areas are the areas that according to this analysis, will not be, at some point in the future, without uh, management efforts, will not be invaded. So that's a pretty grim picture. If we don't do anything, those green areas will be the only areas of native forest left with no strawberry guava invading into it. And so if you get out to the field and see what strawberry guava looks like, in many places, it grows like this, which is just a thicket of very small stems and many, many, many stems. Um, it's difficult to walk through. It's, it's, you're like you're in prison. I mean, it's just bars, right? And this is a 
what a native forest looks like, at least in one of the areas where we work. That's uh, Ohia dominated forest in uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And you see it's very rough, it looks different. This is very smooth, this is very smooth uh, stems, this is very rough fissured bark and these adventitious roots and so forth. So physically very, very different looking. <laughs> So in the mid-aughts, uh, around 2005 and 2006, we established two big, uh, kind of major study sites to work on this problem uh, and to work on some other problems. Um, we, established a, we established these two flux towers to measure the exchanges of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and energy, and many other variables. Both these sites are within White Volcanoes National Park. This one is very close to the main entrance to White Volcanoes National Park near Thurston Lava Tube. We sometimes refer to this as the Thurston mm -hmm. Tower. And the other one uh, is in the Ola'a Track. And it is in an area that was Kohia Forest, but is now heavily invaded with strawberry guava. So we use a technique called eddy covariance to measure these fluxes. And this is kind of the state of the art uh, methodology. Uh, it's, uh, it's expensive and it's difficult uh, to maintain and it's difficult to analyze the data, but it is the best way to do it. Um, and it basically takes advantage of very, very fast measurements made with a three-dimensional sonic anemometer and simultaneously uh, making uh, very, very fast measurements of the three-dimensional uh, wind direction and speed. So. We take the vertical component of the wind speed, so how much up and down, and we correlate that with variations in the gas concentration. <laughs> and it's actually a pretty simple calculation, although there are many, many other things that have to be done to get it right, um, uh, to calculate the vertical movement of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sensible energy um, with this methodology. So after a decade or more of this, and years and years of working on the data, you can boil it down to a graph like that. So miracle happens between those two last slides. Uh, and this is a summary that uh, kind of cuts to the, to the result. And what we're, sh what we're showing on this graph is not net radiation, it's actually the energy used for evapotranspiration divided by the energy available for evapotranspiration. So how much energy is available, how, how much of a proportion of the available energy is used for evapotranspiration. So it's kind of normalizing it. And we do that because these two sites are not exactly the same in terms of available energy. Available energy is a big driver of evapotranspiration. So we try to take that out of it by dividing by the available energy. So what we see is the red line, these are monthly values over about a 10-year period. The red one is the invaded site, and the blue one is the native site. Okay. And uh, so Thurston is that, that one near the, the, the entrance, and this was the one in the Lala track. And you see that it's consistently higher. The proportion of energy used for evapotranspiration at the invaded site is consistently higher by quite a bit. It's about 43% higher in this normalized uh, 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 way of presenting. Uh, this information is about 43% higher at the invaded site than the native site. So we would say that under the same radiation conditions, Based on this, we would expect the non-native site to use about 43% more water than the native site. So that's pretty significant and it's kind of what we were expecting. Um, but we wanted to dig a little deeper and so we made other kinds of measurements to try to understand this better. Uh, one is to look at the canopy water balance and we did that to estimate the fog input and also how much, evap how much wet canopy evaporation there is. We wanted to separate the transpiration and the wet canopy evaporation. Um, and so we used this, uh, we used the data which we collected here. We designed these uh, through fall gauges ourselves and these are giant tipping bucket gauges with troughs um, that are about 20 feet long. They collect water across, a, um, you know, across some distance so we get you know, better representation of a highly spatially variable uh, process, which is the through fall. We also measured stem flow, which is the water running down the outsides of the stems, and we put that into this single layer canopy water balance model, um, and we came up with some results for that. So 
These two graphs show one year of data boiled down to an average daily cycle. Okay, so an average diurnal cycle, mean <coughs> diurnal cycle. And the uh, this kind of purple line here shows the total evapotranspiration. And this dark blue one shows the uh, wet canopy evaporation. So it's you know, water being evaporated off the outsides of the leaves. And if we subtract this from this, we get the transpiration. So this is what the plant is controlling the most, right? And so this is the native site, and this is the invaded site. So let's take a look at that. Um, here at the native site, you see that wet canopy evaporation peaks in mid-morning, like about 10 o'clock, and transpiration peaks in the early afternoon. So does that make sense? Uh, well, this is a place, both of these sites, where the canopy is almost always wet in the morning because of dew and fog and rain that occurs more often at night. And so in the morning, it's generally wet, and it takes a while to dry out. So in the morning, the evapotranspiration is dominated by wet canopy evaporation. And transpiration is low because the water on the outside of the leaves is using the energy and blocking the stomata. As the canopy dries, wet canopy evaporation goes down, transpiration goes up. Another thing to notice, though, is that only half or more of the total evapotranspiration is wet canopy evaporation, which is not as strongly controlled by the species. Right? Now, if you look at the invaded site, we see a different picture. We do see the peak in wet canopy evaporation in the morning and peak in the transpiration later in the day, but you see the transpiration is a much bigger part of the total. The wet canopy evaporation is actually less, but the transpiration is much higher. So if we put that into some numbers, we get this is the wet canopy evaporation here. The uh, invaded site is actually has lower, 21% lower wet canopy evaporation. But the total um, evapotranspiration during this particular year was 15% higher. And that implies that the transpiration was 53% higher based on this analysis at the invaded site. Another way to look at it is to you know, uh, look at individual species. And really, we were trying to answer this question. We say, okay, the evapotranspiration is higher at this site, this invaded site, than it is at the native site, but why is it higher? Is it because of the guava? Is, is it because guava is transpiring more? It seems obvious that that's the answer, right? But we wanted to check. And so to get uh, a better idea, we wanted to make measurements that are can be applied to individual trees or the leaves of individual trees so we can associate the results with particular species. And so we did the true fall, which I told you about before, but here's the uh, some trees that we set up for sap flow measurements. And so that's measuring water moving up the stems of the trees, inside the stems, going to supply water to the leaves for transpiration. And this is a technique where we use a, a device to clamp right onto a leaf and measure the gas exchange right at the leaf level. I'm going to skip that one. This is just looking at the sap flow and how that works. These are Granier probes. This is the method. We put these uh, probes right into the stems of the trees. The upper probe has a heater. And this is measuring the temperature difference between the heated probe, which is <coughs> downstream on the upper side, and the lower probe. And that temperature difference gets smaller if there's water flowing up there. So there's, this, there's an empirical relationship between the delta T and the temperature difference and the rate of water flow in the stem. But to get transpiration, we need to get that velocity of sap flow movement, which we call sap flux density. We also need to know the cross-sectional area that is transporting water. And we call that the xylem or the, the, the sap, sapwood area. And we need to know and that would be per tree, and then we need to know how many trees there are, how many stems there are per ground area. So what is the sap flux density of guava? I had uh, John DeLay, one of my former PhD students, work on this. It's higher, right, for guava, right? No, it's not. It's, uh, John said, it's not significantly different. <coughs> so back to the drawing board, right? Uh, it was kind of an unexpected result. So thinking about this more, we realize that these two sites are quite different structurally, and that might have some influence on the stand level transpiration. So 
These diagrams represent the, the size of the stems of the trees and the number of trees at each of these study areas. So at the native forest site, you have big trees, all native. Uh, they're mostly ohia and sabodium, which is a tree fern, native tree fern, hapu. And this is the invaded site. And uh, you have a few native trees, big native trees, but you have a lot of these small, uh, the small red ones are the strawberry guava. And so you see that those two stands are really different from each other. Well, the reason that matters here is because of this. If we take a cross section of a large tree like an ohia, generally the area that's conducting water, that active sapwood area, is just a thin ring around the outside near the bark, right? And towards, towards the bark, that blue area. And that would be about 16% of the total basal area of that tree for a large tree. For a small ohia, a younger tree, it might be as high as 50%. And that brown area there is not conducting. That would be called the hardwood. It's no longer conducting water. But for guava, these ones in a stand like this, where there are all these small stands, they're generally, the whole basal area is conducting water. So it's 100% xylem. So if you look at these two stands, for basal area, the native stand is about, has about twice the basal area of the invading stand. But for xylem, it's the other way around. The xylem in the non-native site is more than twice as big as the xylem sapwood area in the, um, in the native site. So if you, use, you put the same sapwood density, the same velocities, but over this twice as big an area, you're going to get more transpiration. Right? <clears throat> so we came out with results like this that show about, in this case, found about 76% higher transpiration at the native site, uh, at the non-native site compared to the native. And we projected if it was complete replacement, that it would be a lower value, actually about 20% in this case. So that's a little bit hard to do. Um, and these sites turned out to not be matched as well as we, we thought, as well as we would have liked. So it's a little bit hard to make the comparison for these two sites. But there is evidence of higher transpiration that's at least partly the result of the presence of guava. So lastly, we wanted to nail this down by showing this uh, differences between the characteristics of ohia and guava at the leaf level. And one of our lab members uh, here in residence with us for over two years and has worked with us for about 10 years, currently based in Japan, but still working with us, is Yoshi Miyazawa. And Yoshi's a ecophysiologist, specializes in these leaf gas exchange measurements. He went out to our sites and made measurements. And he came back and he said, no difference between guava and ohia. <laughs> I wanted to take him and John DeLay and put them both into a box and rattle them around a little bit. Are you sure? <laughs> so that left us with a bit of a, a quandary, because we didn't think there was that much uh, leaf area difference between the sites. So just kind of summarizing what we have from these paired sites. Flux Tower shows that there is higher evapotranspiration at the guava site, guava invaded site. Um, canopy water balance indicates that wet canopy evaporation is lower at the guava site, but fiddle leaf tea is higher because of higher transpiration. Sap, sap flow study indicated higher transpiration for guava, but the leaf level measurements did not find any difference between the two. Okay, so that brings us to some work we did recently, and Liat Fortner. It was involved in that. There's Liat, and uh, she's right there. Um, and in this case, we wanted to make rapid assessments of how much difference there might be between stands. We're actually trying to identify good field sites to do new paired studies. So one of the problems we have is that we have a lot of information for two sites. Uh, that's one. That's really one sample. That's one comparison, and that's only, you know, basically. Sites dominated by one uh, native species, tree species, and one non-native tree species. So the problem is there are lots of other species, and each of these species has different characteristics across in different environments. And so we really want to find other ways to expand this study out. And so we look for places to do other paired sites. 
uh, paired, paired plot studies. And we did so by measuring uh, leaf area and photosynthetic response curves. And then I'm going to cut to the chase here. Uh, we use those to estimate transpiration at each of these sites. Okay? So in the first case, we're looking at leaf area, and there's four sites. At each site, there are different stands of different species, dominated by different species. The green bars show stands dominated by native species, and the uh, brown ones uh, show stands dominated by non-native species. And so here's one site, and you see, in general, uh, the non-native, this is leaf area, so in general, the non-native uh, stands generally has higher leaf area, again here, not so here, but here. And so overall, we would say there's, based on these samples anyway, this sample, we would say there's a tendency for the non-native stands to have higher leaf area. And taking that data and taking the, the leaf level characteristics, photosynthetic curves, and putting that into a model, we estimate transpiration for the same location, same stands. And again, uh, green is the native stand, native dominated stands, brown is the non-native. And you see that there's generally, not in all cases, but at three out of the four, you have uh, the non-native stands having higher transpiration than the native stands. <coughs> so from that, we find that uh, when we compare for all these sites, that there's generally higher leaf area in the plots with non-native species, um, especially for strawberry guava, Christmas berry, and ginger. Leaf gas exchange characteristics for native and non-native species did differ. So whereas Yoshi found for our two sites that they were not significantly different, for some of these sites there were significant differences. And so that kind of underlines the point that we can't just rely on one pair and extrapolate that to every, everywhere. And transpiration was generally higher for the non-native stands, and that was in large part because of the higher leaf area, but also because of the different leaf gas exchange characteristics. So I'm running a little short of time, um, so I'm just going to flip through the last few slides here, but the point I want to make is that we are um, proposing now to extend this type of methodology. Um, so you know, we have until now been focused on making measurements at paired sites, and we put a lot of effort into finding new paired sites. There's a, it's very important that we do additional paired site studies because we get so much information at those sites by studying you know, a situation over a period of several years with lots and lots of sensors running uh, kind of permanently installed. Uh, but we can never really answer all the questions by doing that alone. First of all, it's very hard to find these sites. There just are not many places where you have both species uh, in a situation side by side uh, where we can make a clear distinction between uh, the process of these two, two species. Um, and secondly, it's very expensive. So we just there's a limit to how many of these sites we could uh, possibly ever uh, study. So what we want to do is, I'm going to skip this. Um, what we want to do is set up a system where we have both a few more of these paired sites, but also do these rapid assessments using leaf area measurements and uh, leaf level measurements can be done quickly or sap flow done on the terminal branches that can be installed, run for a few days, and move to another site. So then we can extend this, these measurements all across the landscape and then use statistical models to put together uh, transpiration maps of um, across the entire state for each species. And that's really what we, what we need to do. So I'm going to skip this and just Go to here. So what we want to do is, based on our field measurements across extensive sites, extensive number of sites, we want to develop statistical models predicting transpiration for each species, then use species distribution maps, okay, which are, is another thing that needs to be developed, and leaf area index maps, and put that all together to produce transpiration maps for each species. Okay, so this has a lot of advantages, um, and I think will stop, will give us the answer to this question. And by doing other things, we'll chip away at it, but we really won't get the answer. I think this is a strategy that will get us there. 
Okay, that's all I have. Thanks.